This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. <laughs> this is a show about science. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> by scientists. Oh. Tonight, Techno investigates shrimp safety. Seafood by nature is a high risk commodity. Fresh, Americans fresh, love fresh. their shrimp, but most of it comes from countries that use extensive antibiotics that could make you ill. Now, Techno goes inside the federal testing program. I'm making a fruit powder. That's supposed to protect the food supply. Dr. Shini Samara is a mechanical engineer. She'll share the results of her investigation. Now, how dangerous is that for human beings? And I'm Phil Torres. I'm an entomologist. I visit a shrimp farm in the middle of Indiana. Yes, Indiana. That could revolutionize the industry. Wow. This is like a little laboratory here. Yes, it is. And a shrimp farm. Kara Santa Maria is a neuroscientist. Imagine that you are one of the first to take a trip to Mars. This is the definition of pioneering. That's what makes it exciting. That's our team. Now let's do some science. Hey, I got some. Hey guys, and welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Dr. Shinny Samara and Kara Santa Maria. Now guys, I'm not gonna lie, one of my favorite things is shrimp sizzling away on a hot grill, but I also have a fair amount of hesitation when it comes to actually knowing where that shrimp comes from. Yeah, and you may not realize it, but shrimp raised overseas can have high levels of antibiotics and other additives that don't always pass American safety standards. And America imports a lot of shrimp, over a billion pounds worth. So we asked the Food and Drug Administration, the agency responsible for policing US ports, if we could follow them while they test for unsafe shipments. America has a jumbo appetite for shrimp. Now, it's a little piece of flesh that they could eat easy. It's kind of like popcorn of the sea. Americans eat an average of four pounds per person per year. At Fred 62 in Los Angeles, Chef Fred Eric serves a lot of shrimp. It's very difficult as a chef or restaurateur to buy shrimp with the confidence that what you're serving them is going to be good Thai cob fresh witch with shrimp. Americans' taste for shrimp comes with a price. Oh, wow. 90% of all the shrimp eaten in the US is imported much of it from countries like India, Thailand, and Indonesia. Sometimes shrimp is raised overseas using production drugs like antibiotics that are approved for use in those countries, but not approved for use in the US. Johns Hopkins microbiologist David Love surveyed federal data on drugs found in imported shrimp. Some of the top drugs that we found in shrimp were nitrofurans, chloramphenicol, tetracycline, sulfonamides and streptomycin. What does it mean for the consumer to be exposed to antibiotic resistant bacteria? If you get an infection uh, from these bacteria, it can be harder to treat using antibiotics, especially if uh, these bacteria are resistant to the antibiotics that your uh, doctor would prescribe. Overseas shrimp farms that use antibiotics often farm with overcrowded ponds. And diseases are a big deal in shrimp farming. Uh, there can be a high mortality rate uh, in some shrimp farms. The Food and Drug Administration polices shrimp imports. 5.5 billion pounds of seafood is imported into the United States every year, and much of it ends up in a cold storage facility like this one in Southern California. But only a tiny fraction of all of that seafood is actually inspected. So we've come here today to find out exactly how the FDA does that. Emily Morrison is a veteran FDA inspector. We've collected one subsample out of 15 random boxes. And now I'm in the process of bagging them up. Put them in coolers and ship it to the lab. 
A computer system red flags imports believed to pose the greatest risk based on country of origin and a company's past history of violations. Seafood by nature is a high risk commodity. Dan Solis heads inspections at the Port of Los Angeles. So there are many boxes here and they're all packed full. What percentage of this sample gets chosen to be taken to the lab? So FDA reviews all electronic transmissions. We utilize things like foreign inspection, domestic inspection, whether it was sampled in another port, all that information is gathered within the PREDICT application, and then that shipment will be given a risk score. The higher the risk score, the more chances one of these officers will sample that, that shipment. Once the FDA inspector picks samples for inspection, they're sent to an FDA lab, like this one in Irvine, California. Are you making a shrimp smoothie? I'm making a shrimp powder. Woo! Like a magic trick. Yeah. <laughs> the shrimp powder is mixed with a chemical solvent, dried and liquefied again to run through an analyzer. Kai Wang is an FDA chemist. So Kai, the results are in from the test. Mm -hmm. What are they showing us? In this case, the company I'm working for is natural furans. And how dangerous is that for human beings? Natural furan is dangerous for human beings because it's carcinogenic. The FDA action level for natural furan is at one parts per billion. One parts per billion is equivalent to working for one gram of salt in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Wow. So how many parts per billion is this result? I would say it's about one to two parts per billion. So two grains of salt in an Olympic-sized swimming pool and you've mm. managed to find it in that vial. Yeah. That's incredible. So that batch of shrimp is not allowed in this country, essentially. It's not going to be allowed in this country. The FDA simply isn't testing enough on the imported market to really find all of these violative residues. Dr. Avashi Rangan headed a study of imported shrimp for the June 2015 issue of the influential magazine Consumer Reports. Of the 205 imported farmed samples that we found, 11 of those actually had illegal residues of antibiotics on them. That comes out to about 5% of the imported farmed shrimp samples being contaminated with an illegal antibiotic residue. The fact that the FDA only tests about 0.7% of all the shrimp in this country for those antibiotic residues suggests that the agency is not actually testing enough shrimp to catch the amount of illegal residue products that may be coming into the market. However, many of the countries that export the shrimp permit the use of antibiotics. When you feed low levels of antibiotics every day, you're not feeding them enough to necessarily kill bacteria. Those bacteria can become resistant to those antibiotics, and that can make those antibiotics less effective in people if we're infected by those bacteria. Just as worrisome was the number of shrimp that tested positive for bacteria. We found about a third of the shrimp that we had had Vibrio contamination. Vibrio is one of the few foodborne illnesses on the rise. Seven of the samples we found had MRSA. That's concerning too, and that's probably primarily associated with the amount of processing that goes on with shrimp production. Both have the potential to cause illness, although through the cooking process, they can be killed. We do know that there are shrimp farms and shrimp production practices that are doing a lot more to address those issues, that are addressing hygiene and addressing other issues so that they aren't heavily reliant on drugs or other chemicals. 600 miles from the nearest ocean, nestled in a patchwork of windmills and soybean and cornfields, is tiny Fowler, Indiana, home to RDM Aquaculture, a mom-and-pop indoor saltwater shrimp farm. Hi, how hey are guys. you? Very good. Hi, I'm Daryl. Daryl, very and nice I'm to Carlina. meet you. And I'm Carlina. Welcome to RDM Shrimp. Let's go. Carlena and Daryl Brown are accidental shrimp farming pioneers. How are you doing on count? I'm at six pounds. With their two dozen basic backyard pools as growing tanks, they've perfected an indoor system with zero waste, no chemicals, and a 90% survival rate. That's a third higher than traditional outdoor shrimp farms. Wow, 
This is like a little laboratory here. Yes, it is. And a shrimp farm. Yes, it is. We do nine tests every single day. We do temperature, dissolved oxygen, nitrite, CO2, salinity, alkalinity, pH, ammonia, and flock. As you can see, our water is brown. The test we're doing here right now is we're trying to see how much bacteria is in our water, and we call it a settling. So you're basically waiting for all this bacteria to go to the bottom, and that tells you how much is in how it. How much we have in it, exactly. Wow. And if we're over a certain level, then we have to get it out of the tanks, otherwise it's gonna start suffocating out the shrimp. That's very important, that has to be done every day. Basically, we're not even shrimp farmers anymore, we actually call ourselves guardians of water. As long as the water does what it's supposed to be doing, the shrimp do just fine. We add no antibiotics, no hormones are ever added into our tanks. You heard that right. No antibiotics, no hormones, just fish food, salt, and baking soda. It's called a heterotrophic bioflock system, a process that revolves around bacteria. And now, it looks very brown. What is this brown that I'm seeing? The brown is the bacteria. The bacteria is what contain, eats all their way so that they can survive without a major filter system. Here's what's happening below the surface. The shrimp eat their feed and excrete ammonia. The bacteria turns that into toxic nitrites. Other bacteria turn that into benign nitrates. And as the water is aerated, the nitrates turn into a harmless gas and around and around. How long have you had this water? Uh, four years. And how does that compare to other shrimp farms? Most of them don't have water that long. We, by mistake, actually kept our water. It's like it's maturing. It's like wine. Yeah, it does. And we just found out that the older it gets, the better it gets. And so, too, for the shrimp. The growing process starts every month with about 250,000 newborns called post larvals, nicknamed PLs. Now we're going to show you about our PLs. And when they come in, they're the size of an eyelash. So it's hard to see inside this water, but how many shrimp are actually in here? We uh, stock about 17,000, each one of my six tanks here. So what are all these tubes coming down? Those are air lines. And that adds the oxygen? Adds their oxygen, and it keeps everything in suspension. Because if this stuff settles, I only have 20 minutes and they're dead. 20 minutes? 20 minutes and they'll be dead. Everything here seems so precise. It has to be. It's mother nature. Well, it is mother nature but with a lot of help from a mother in Indiana. Now notice there's foam on top. What is this foam? The foam is mostly CO2 mixing with their feed that just comes to the top and it'll actually disappear. So it's just part of the process? It's part of the process. Hey, I got some. Yep, you did. Look at that. Wow. So this is not what you see in the supermarket when you get a shrimp? No, because like I said, they can't be frozen with the hat on. They're very translucent. And one of the characteristics we actually look for them on is you see the long antennas, mm -hmm. that tells me they're happy. If their antennas are short, they're stressing out. But if you can see here, this is their only protection, and he's mad right now. That mouthpiece is coming yeah. forward. So he's very angry at me the right now. The shrimp has a little horn. Yeah, and then if you can look right where your thumb is at, that's mm -hmm. where his heart is at also. And you can see his heart beating. Wow, you really can. A month later, they're promoted to the production tank where they'll turn into dinner. Now we're talking. So, so you need 40 of them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to keep going. You would have to keep going. And you got six. <laughs> Are you saying I'm a bad scooper? <laughs> the Browns sell about 500 pounds directly to walk-ins each month at $18 a pound. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you, thank you. very much. They've also sold their know-how to two dozen startup farms in the U.S. as well as ones in Switzerland, Haiti, and Spain. These companies are really innovators. They're trying out new technology. Johns Hopkins microbiologist David Love studies shrimp production. He gives the production like the Browns a high grade with one caveat, one that could ultimately make or break in the business world. A lot of these farms might start out with a bang, but then fizzle after a few years because they don't make money. For the Browns, shrimp farming is paying off. No financial fizzle, only sizzle, as the business continues to grow. Is it ready yet? Just about. But the proof of their success is what ends up on the plate. And in this case, innovation tastes pretty good when served with a profit. That is so good. Now, I still can't get over the fact that possibly the cleanest and arguably the best shrimp in the world may come from the middle of Indiana, so I brought you guys some. Mm. Yes. 
and the tank it looks a little gross, I get that, but it's chemistry in there, and really the good. end result is really good. There's a global problem with using a lot of antibiotics in farming. The more antibiotics used, the more we're going to start seeing antibiotic resistant superbugs. It happens in uh, agribusiness here in the US, it happens overseas, and it even happens in medical practice. You know, a lot of people ask, why should we care if there's some superbug that can infect shrimp? How does that affect us? But what they found is that bacteria can actually swap genes. So potentially, if a bacteria that infects shrimp becomes resistant, it could swap that gene into a bacteria that infects us, and so that resistance can be passed on, and the amount of, you know, millions of pounds of antibiotics are being used around the world, not just in shrimp, but in cattle and poultry as well, that is gonna catch up to us when it hits our healthcare system. Yeah, it's called a, it's called a spillover event. It's a zoonotic infection. It's an infection that happens in an animal species, and then, just like that, a human can get infected too. And it's been the source of most deadly diseases that medicine can't keep up with. And that's where you look at the numbers, okay, we have a billion pounds getting imported here. Only 2% actually gets inspected. What about the other 98%? It's important to have confidence in the system moving forward if we're gonna keep eating shrimp. And the inspection process was so random. I mean, the amount of shipment that came in versus what actually made it into a lab was tiny. Kara, what do you have coming up for us next? Yeah, really interesting story. Now, imagine that you are one of the first pioneers to take a trip to Mars, but also imagine that you're not allowed to come home. It's a one-way trip. Would you guys do it? I met a woman who's already signed up, and she's raring to go. For decades, humanity has been fascinated with a manned expedition to Mars. This is the definition of pioneering. That doesn't scare you? That's what makes it exciting. Robotic pioneers like Mars Curiosity rover have been crawling around the cratered landscape, uncovering clues about whether this distant planet can sustain life as we know it. Do you have the right stuff? I, can, I have that right stuff. Jamie Del Rosario is a 27-year-old entrepreneur and CEO of International Metal Source, a raw materials company that supplies metals to aerospace companies like SpaceX and Lockheed Martin. She is one of 100 candidates that has been selected by Mars One, a private company that wants to colonize the red planet. The catch? There's no return flight home. What do you say to people when they say, Jamie, this is a suicide mission. Why are you doing it? They call it a suicide mission, but it's something that I chose. I'm creating my own destiny for myself. And, and if it's a destiny that would help humanity, I'm all for it. According to Mars One, one of the main goals of the project is to establish an interplanetary species to preserve the human race. I want to contribute directly to mankind's confident expansion into the solar system, which we have to do if we're going to survive in the long term. Jamie made it to the top 100, the third round of a selection process Mars One says started with 200,000 online applicants. Ultimately, 24 crew members will be chosen. Do you think that anybody with enough training could become an astronaut? I believe that if you have the um, the motivation and then the determination of, of wanting to do it, you can. A mission to Mars is obviously no simple matter. Pasadena, California is home to the Mars program at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. NASA has taken man to the moon and back, but they've approached this journey with a much more deliberate and rigorous training program. I'm now on the base on Mars and I will give you a little tour. In 2015, six volunteer scientists walked out of a dome on the side of a Hawaiian volcano after being locked away by NASA for eight months. This was a simulated experiment of what life on Mars would be like. Coexisting is one challenge. Getting there and surviving is an entirely different endeavor. Landing on Mars is still a pretty well, sometimes it can be quite a terrifying thing. Dr. Richard Zurich is the chief scientist for the Mars program at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. A lot of things have to happen right. Right now, we fly into the atmospheres, 
We have a heat shield that protects us, but we're also trying to slow down so that we can land softly. Now we're talking about a very different scale of endeavor. We're landing a metric ton down on the planet today. We think for human missions to get stuff down on the surface that they can use, that they can be there for a prolonged period of time, that means 40, 50 metric tons. That's a lot of material. Today, we don't know how to land that. Mars One has come under critical fire for their project, primarily due to funding issues and for reports of recording the mission for a reality television show. In March 2015, CEO Boz Lonsdorp took to YouTube to respond. They are currently uh, selling our, the documentary series uh, to an international broadcaster. Uh, there's no deal in place yet, but it's, it's looking very promising. There's a lot of interest. At Mars One, we really value uh, good criticism about our mission because it helps us to improve our mission. Lonsdorp also tells Techno, quote, there are less serious critics who are only interested to sabotage our mission, for example, by lying. But even if this nonprofit's mission never launches, NASA is laying the groundwork today. NASA is very much in the mode of there are going to be humans on Mars. We're in the first stages of trying to understand what it takes to actually be able to explore with humans on the surface of the planet. We've made a good start on that with our robotic programs. First, it's get down there, see what the planet is like, get those first explorers out there on the surface, and then we can see what the future holds. Not in a million years would I want to go and colonize Mars. I mean, there's so many risks. It's so frightening to me. What is it about you that's different from me and probably from most of the people living on this planet who are afraid to go? Some people just have different goals and missions. I want to do something that would change the world or help the world. So if you are selected to go to Mars, do you foresee yourself getting married on Mars, having children on there? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be interesting because it will happen. Do you think that's going to be a part of your training? I would think so. I mean, that's something that we cannot shine away from because we're the new frontiers of colonizing another planet in the solar system. Are you scared? Leaving Earth behind, I will miss it. Everybody's trying to get to Mars. And I think what stands out with Mars One is the permanent settlement. And I think this is the time now. So I'm really interested, you guys. Would you sign up for a one-way mission to Mars? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? No. What you about know, you? I would possibly, but I don't think I would sign up for this one-way mission to <laughs> Mars. I mean, if you look through history, so many pioneers and explorers were, to be fair, a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they succeeded, but other times they didn't. But it always would push progress forward just a little bit. It's true. Yeah, I think the merit of this project is the fact that the goal is to try to be able to to achieve living on Mars. And the result of having a goal like that, which is extremely ambitious, is the amount of technology that's gonna be developed. You know, just crazy inventions and innovations that are gonna come out of quite a kind of pie in the sky it's objective. True. You know, I think we've talked sustaining life on other planets versus sustaining life here on Earth. Really interesting topics today, guys, so thank you for them. We'll have a lot more of these stories next time here on Techno. We'll see you then. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus, and more.